So when I was preparing this around about yesterday morning or Friday evening yesterday morning, I realised that um, I was only going to get halfway through that reading. So we'll have the same reading next week and we'll do the, the back end of it. There's just so much in the first then the first half of that reading that you just don't realise is there until you have a really good think about it. So we're in week four of our life of David. You might remember as we just recap a bit, we saw in week one we saw how God did not choose David to be king over Israel because of his looks or his wealth or number of followers on Facebook. God chose David because he was a man after God's own heart. For all his failings, and there were many, he always turned to God in repentance and faith. In week two we saw how David killed the giant Goliath. And we learned a number of ways that we can adapt ourselves to defeat the giants that are trying to bring us down and destroy us. Then last week we learned that just because the crowds are cheering for you doesn't mean that all is well. While the crowds were cheering David, Saul was seeking into a deep and violent depression. And this began a cycle of David faithfully serving Saul as a military leader, as a musician. And at the same time, Saul was taking every opportunity to murder David. We ended up with David taking refuge in Gath as a man who was visibly insane. The whole drool down the beard and crazy behaviour and everything. So, he's run away to Gath. That's not, not, the, uh, not the actions of a sane man, is it? It's a man who, in just the tiniest little bit, is starting to be like Saul, isn't he? He's not listening to God. He's doing what he thinks is right. And it's so clearly and utterly not right. But he doesn't see it. We see the deterioration in David's mental state as the pressures of continually fleeing from the murderous Saul. Saul took their toll on him. He had no friends other than Jonathan. Or rather, should we say, he thought he had no friends other than Jonathan who couldn't be with him for obvious reasons. He could not visit his family because that would cause Saul to murder them all. If he had not, if he had not already done so. See, David didn't even know if his family was alive or not. The craziness of his entry into Gath showed that David was no longer trusting in the Lord to take care of him and keep him safe. He was trying to reason with his own mind and to be honest, he wasn't doing a very good job of it. But that's not all that was going on. When we have a look at what he wrote when he was in Gath, it seems that he had a personal revival. That, that the ridiculousness of his behaviour and what he was trying to do and where he had placed himself in the heart of his enemy's hometown, he suddenly realised, hang on, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, I should not be doing this. And so, what did David do? He turned to God. And uh, I'm going to ask David to read for us Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble should hear of it and be glad. I magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. 
O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you of the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his eyes are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them from all of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them um, out. The Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none, none of those who trust him shall be condemned. Thanks, Mike. Doesn't sound like the words of a crazy man, does it? No. no. I think he's only got a revelation of what he needed to be doing. Which is pretty fortunate because at that point, Achish, the king of David, had driven him out of Gath. And at this point, David, in his newly revived state of mind, knew exactly where he had to go. Now, I find that I need to constantly remind myself that all these events took place in a very small geographic area. But when you go to Israel, what happened here could be found probably three or four times in the Bible, right? Every square inch of that ground, something happened on and here we have a situation where one of the five big cities of Philistia, Gath, is on the border with Israel, right on the border, okay? And it's situated at the mouth of the Valley of Elah, right? So all the, all the people had to do, the army that invaded Israel only had to walk out through the gates 15 k up the valley, and that's where the battle took place between David and Goliath. Just 15k from the city, you could probably see the city from where they were, because it's uphill. And from the battle site, it was just a 5k hike into the hills. You know, the valley, so there's hills on both sides. You just hike five k's up into the, the hills on the south side of the valley to the cave of Adullam. Now, there's a couple of organisations who've done really good videos on this. They found the cave of Adullam, right? And it's not just one cave, it's, it's, it's at the top of a, of a high hill and it, the whole hill is honeycombed with this cave system. It's not just a hole in the ground, right, or a hole in the side of a, of a hill. This is a massive cave system, and all the ways, all the entrances and exits are completely hidden. Right, the bush and the, the shrubs and the grass and, and everything hide these things. You have to know where you're going to find them. From up there, David had a commanding view for kilometres all around. He could see anyone approaching. He may even have been able to see Gath from up there. Right? That's how it's a it's really small uh, area. The distances are very small. No cars, of course. They, uh, everywhere they went, they walked.
and yet he could come and go at will, completely unseen. John Butler in his biographical book on the life of David writes, if you are favoured of God and called into special service for him, do not be surprised at the caves of loneliness you will often find yourself in because the world despises and rejects you. The good and the honourable and the godly will be put in the cave of Adullam every chance the world gets. But the cave of Adullam is not the end. One day God will overturn, sorry, will upright and overturn the tables of justice and judgment. And then all of God's faithful ones will experience great honour, which will more than compensate for any cave of disrespect that they have been forced into by a world that reflects the guile of Saul more than the grace of God. What wonderful provision by God for the man who was now trusting him fully. The cave was way more than enough room for David alone because God knew what was going to happen next. So in the first verse of our reading, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Okay, it's a pretty tough walk from Bethlehem to Adullam, about 10 miles, 18, 20 k's, but it's really rough country. It's the Shafila, right? It's the hill country between the coast and the high area around Jerusalem and, the, and Judah. It's, it's very hilly, no roads, right? And so it's, it's a very difficult walk. But they did. They made the walk. The whole family came to him. And when you think about it, there were two reasons for the family to join David at the cave. The first was to support him. It had to be especially gratifying to him to have his brethren come to the cave, inasmuch as earlier we noticed some jealousy among the brothers, especially on the part of his oldest brother Eliab. But those hard feelings have vanished as they seek out David in the cave. We will shortly see David providing special care for his parents after they came to the cave, but the lesson here about his family is for the home to provide support for any of its members who are being persecuted by an ungodly world. So, mutual support, familyness, togetherness, that's the first reason. The second reason is, of course, the family joined David for safety. Saul had shown himself to be relentlessly cruel in the persecution of those who he no longer trusted. And it was normal practice in those days not only to kill an enemy, but also to seek his whole extended family and kill them all as examples to those who might also seek to be disloyal to the king. If you're disloyal to me, this is what will happen to you and your whole family. As John Butler described it, evil rulers are a peril to good people. Beside the peril to their lives, the loss and displacement for David's family materially because of Saul had to be enormous. Very, this was a very wealthy family. Not livestock, herds, the whole box and dice. They would have been a wealthy family. And then this happened in verse 2. Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became a captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now, I don't know about you, but even in my research for this, I watched probably half a dozen messages. And almost without exception, every single person that preached this message, and that's the message I've heard my whole life, were that the, these men who joined David were a bunch of no-good, lazy, complaining deadbeats. 
All right? That's what the scripture says, isn't it? Everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented, everyone who was in distress gathered to him. He had 400 men. I think he can probably add his, their families to that. Right, so it's a big cave system that can handle them comfortably. So the idea with these, uh, all these other preachers is that shiftless and irresponsible men who would not be in this situation if they were good men. But have a think about it. Would we describe David in this way? Why not? He was in the position he was in because of a wicked and insane king trying to kill him. If this was true for David, then it was quite logical that this was true for the others. They were likely men who had fought beside David and were sickened by Saul's attempts to have them kill their brother in arms. Saul would have made these men outcasts by any means that he could. He would have taken their properties out from under them and given them to those of the tribe of Benjamin, which was his tribe. So they'd be impoverished, they'd be without debt, they'd be discontented about, about the way the king was treated David and treating them. And they would certainly be distressed about what was happening in their country. It's no wonder that they came to the cave to be with David. You know, doubtless there may have been among the young men some who were more adventurous than devout and cared for their leader's sword and spear more than for his psalms, the young blokes. But they were in general young men of a patriotic character who has suffered tyranny and damage through the misrule of time and found the public disorder and the tyranny unacceptable, intolerable. The first thing the scripture notes is that they submitted to him and set him as captain over them. These blokes weren't idiots, they were very smart. They were wise. They knew who the best man in Israel was to be their captain. And they did not make David their captain just by words. These men were loyal and courageous to David in deeds as well. Later on in scripture, some great military feats of these men are recorded in detail, which shows more about their gallant deeds under David's Leadership. Have you ever heard of David's mighty men of valour? That's these men. Shiftless deadbeats. Don't just change into that overnight. It takes years and years of training to become a mighty man of valour. A lifetime of training. Right? It doesn't just happen overnight. These were already warriors. The finest warriors in the country. From these men came some of David's greatest leaders and soldiers. We will see their character shine in the next chapters of Scripture. These followers serve under David's leadership and command. They'd do anything for him. Secondly, David got to find out who his true friends were. As a public hero and later king, David would have been surrounded by those who called themselves friends. It was those that came to him in his hour of need and at great personal peril to their own lives that showed David the loyalty that he needed from his true friends. We all know, I'm sure by now you all live long enough to have a, a, a real crisis in your life and you found out very quickly who your real friends were. Those who stuck with you through that crisis and supported you in it. 
Lastly, when these men came to David, they were in debt, distressed and discontented. And under David, they quickly became rich from the spoils of his military raids. These men now saw victories and their discontent turned to contentment. There is nothing a soldier likes more than winning. Losing really sucks. Okay. <laughs> Losing is not a good idea in ancient days, much the same way as today. There was no surrender. Right. You either won or you died. Losing's bad. So serving the Lord's anointed, David, was not a disappointment like Saul had turned out to be. And the same is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him the captain of your life. And great changes will occur. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Nothing can change one's life so blessed as Jesus Christ, of whom David is a type, if you like, a shadow of who was to come. Come to him and you will experience blessed and eternal changes in your life as he changes you to become more and more like him every day of your life when you follow him. Amen. Amen. Amen.